Okay, friends, put your hands together for John Gailey, our technical fellow from Bowen. Good afternoon, students. Uh, my name is John. I'm an engineer for the Bowen Company, and I'm going to talk today about the space shuttle. The Boeing's replacement for the space shuttle, the CSP-100 space app. Before I talk about rockets and such, I, I want to talk a little bit about who I am. And uh, when I was about your age, I was always interested in taking things apart and building things. These pictures are between me and my brother, Chris. Uh, in sixth grade, we built our first robot, one of three. And then in, in college, we built a one-built motorcycle. It's a seven-foot diameter wheel. We sit in the middle of it, and we get right down the road. So after I graduated college, I went to work for the Boeing Company, which has been great because I get to work on all different kinds of airplanes. And the first one that I worked on was the Space Shuttle. The Space Shuttle, or Space Transportation System, was the United States manned launch vehicle system between 1981 and 2011. What was really cool about the Space Shuttle would take off vertically, and then it would land with wings like an airplane. When the shuttle was launched, it would take usually between four and seven astronauts and up to 50,000 pounds of payload. It's a lot of payload. The first shuttle was Shuttle Columbia, and it launched on April 12, 1981. And that's what you're seeing a picture of right here. So where did the shuttles launch from? They launched from Kennedy Space Center, which is located in Florida. It's only like an hour east of Disney World. So if anyone's on vacation at Disney World, you might want to talk to your parents about taking a quick trip over to the Kennedy Space Center. There's a lot of interesting stuff that you can see there, and I'll show some of that later in this presentation. At the Kennedy Space Center, there's a Launch Complex 39, and that's where the rockets were put together and, and launched from. You can see the vehicles in the building in the middle of the picture, and the two launch sites close to the ocean. The Kennedy Space Center was first put together and created to support the Apollo program. The Apollo program mission was to land people on the surface of the moon and bring them back to Earth safely. Two pictures from that era. Saturn rocket being wheeled out of the vehicle assembly building and uh, Buzz Aldrin walking on the surface of the moon. So the program was very successful. We had humans walking on the moon. Now if we go back and look at this launch complex 39, see the vehicle assembly building and the launch pads were off in the distance. They're actually 4.2 miles away. So how did the shuttle get all the way to the launch pad? It was on a crawler transporter. This vehicle moved at a speed of one mile per hour, so it took four to five hours to get the shuttle all the way out to the launch pad. So we look at the vehicle assembly building. This is a pretty large building. If you look at the small cars, it gives you a sense of how large this building is, but I also want to look at the flag that's on the side of the building. If I blow up that flag, I see there's men on scaffolding. Looks like they're maybe they're touching up the paint on the flag really get a sense of the size of this building. It's 52 stories tall, 530 feet. So now let's talk about the assembly process. The shuttle is brought over to the vehicle assembly building, brought inside on a trailer. A crane is attached to it, and then the crane lifts it up and tilts it into the vertical position as to get ready for launch. It's lifted up inside the vehicle assembly building, and then it's brought over to the external tank which you see in orange. And as it lowers down on the internal, on, on the internal tank, you see the solid rocket boosters on either side of that tank. And once it's in place, then it's attached to the external tank. Now let's talk about the launch stack components. First, you have the solid rocket boosters. They're about 150 feet in length, 12 feet in diameter, and they provide 3.3 million pounds of thrust. They're attached to the external tank, which is about 150 feet in length, but it's 30 feet in diameter. And this is actually a tank with two tanks inside of it. The first tank holds liquid oxygen, 143,000 gallons of it. The second tank is liquid hydrogen, and it holds 385,000 gallons. Also attached to the external tank is the shuttle. The shuttle has three main engines on it, which burn that liquid fuel. They burn at a pretty fast rate. They burn the oxygen about 280 gallons per second, and the hydrogen 750 gallons per second. So that's over 1,000 gallons per second that burns the fuel. 
I'm going to show you a shuttle launch. I'm going to tell you a little about what you're going to see first, though. Giant sparklers are used to ignite the engines on the shuttles. And when they're lit, you're going to see the shuttle jump. And then the solid rocket boosters are going to kick in, and we're going to see the shuttle lift off. Into the flight, you're going to see the shuttle actually rotate, and it's almost flying upside down. And it's in this position that it'll reach speeds of Mach 2.6, or 2,000 miles an hour. I cut the launch video down a little bit and jump ahead. It's 120 seconds. And we'll see the solid rocket boosters separate. So we're ready for the launch. Eleven, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, eight, eight, start, two, one, booster ignition, and liftoff of the space shuttle Discovery, returning to the space station, paving the way for future missions beyond. Solid rocket booster separation confirmed. Guidance now converging. Discoveries on board computers commanding the main. Well, the shuttle program has since retired. And but we're lucky enough that the shuttles have been spread across the United States so we can have an opportunity to go see them. Discovery here, Washington, D.C. Um, Endeavor is in uh, California. The Enterprise is in New York. And Atlantis is at the Kennedy Space Center. So I told you there's some cool stuff to see. Outside of this building where Atlantis is, is a rocket garden. And you can walk around these rockets. Some are over 100 feet in height and hear stories about how these rockets are used. And if you plan your trip just right, they still do rocket launches all the time. So the next launch is on May 20th, not too many days away. And it's for an Atlas V rocket. I'm going to show you a launch of that Atlas V rocket. And this is the same rocket that's going to be used to carry the CSB-100 space capsule. Five, four, three, two, one main engine start, ignition, and liftoff of the Atlas V with Maven, looking for clues about the evolution of Mars through its atmosphere. So let's talk about this new space capsule. Uh, it's similar to the Apollo vehicle uh, in, in, in shape, uh, but it's a little bit larger. Where the Apollo could hold three people, this can hold up to seven people. And the first passenger expected in 2017. Because it doesn't have wings like the shuttle did, it's not going to be able to land like the shuttle. Uh, it'll probably touch down in the ocean like the Apollo, but we also had an airbag to this, large airbag. So it can land in the desert, and the airbags help push it to the landing of the astronauts inside. Here's a quick video of the CSC 100. So it's like the shuttle, where we carry passengers and payload. CSP program says the payload's going to go up separately, and the astronauts will go up in the capsule. Primer O. The capsule is similar to the Apollo, but it's much more advanced on the inside. This is what we're currently working on right now, trying to make this work for the astronauts. And we'll see a couple shots of astronauts inside this developmental capsule getting it ready for that launch in 2017. Well, I mentioned it was on the Atlas V. And that was the launch we just saw. And now it's carrying up the CST to the International Space Station. And that's the primary goal of the CST-100, to go to the space station and to other space stations that are currently being developed. 2015 marks the 25th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and this is a picture of Westerland 2. It's a group of about 3,000 stars, only 20,000 light years from Earth. Uh, and I thought it was a great opportunity to talk about NASA's mission 
to pioneer the future of space exploration, scientific discovery, and aeronautics research. When I think about traveling through space and traveling to different planets, it reminds me of a famous quote from the founders of Boeing Company. He said, we embark as pioneers upon a new science and industry in which our problems are so new and unusual that it behooves no one to dismiss any novel idea with the statement that can't be done. And a great example of this is the first aircraft we made at the Boeing Company had a max speed of 75 miles per hour. Now, less than 100 years later, we're working with technology that will enable us to go 4,000 miles per hour. My oldest daughter, Audrey, told me something that really stuck with me. She quoted somebody and said, don't tell me the sky is the limit when there are footprints on the moon. And I thought it was a great, a great saying that I want to share with you today. Um, sky is not the limit. You guys can do anything you want to if you put your minds to it. And you know, as I look around here, I, I, I wonder if someone out here will have their footprints photographed on Mars or some other planets that we heard about, and we'll see them in the presentation someday. Thanks, everybody. part of our TEDxU Fast Paper Ballad. We'll be back next year. Over and out.